In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness and health questions. We talk about exercises, best exercises. We talk about how to train the body, become fit. But in the intro portion of this episode, we talk about current events, news articles, scientific studies, talk about our lives, and we do mention our sponsors. Here's what went on in today's episode. First off, we start talking about uh, Adam's net worth. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently there's a website that- He's listed, hiding something from us. That listed Adam's net worth, totally inaccurate, but it was absolutely hilarious. Then he talked about how he played basketball with a 12-year-old and just hooped all over him. Yeah. Super braggadocious about it. I don't know if that's- yeah. Get that out of my house. <laughs> I talked about Lent. Uh, as of the recording of this episode, Lent is starting. Um, and if you're not religious, there's a lot of value in practicing detachment. So that was a really good- conversation. Then we talked about weighted stretching and how it may improve your results or get you to build muscle faster. Then we talked about the Utah bill that decriminalized polygamy, finally. All right. You hear uh, that, honey? <laughs> Justin We're talked about to Utah. his last improv classes. I talked about using a hand gripper in the studio to help me pay attention because I have ADD. Uh, we talked about uh, the uh, macro comparison between so macros are proteins, fats, carbohydrates, uh, and then of course calories. We compared Fruit Loops, uh, you know the sugary cereal that is terrible yeah. for you. Toucan Sam to Magic Spoon, which tastes just like uh, Fruit Loops or very close to Fruit Loops, but has a much better macronutrient profile. No sugar, tons of protein, whey protein, good quality protein. It's a great product. We work with Magic Spoon again. They make these mm. really delicious cereals that have phenomenal protein content. No sugar, uh, great macronutrient uh, uh, this profile. This is the way. Here's how you get a discount, because we do have a Mind Pump discount if you want to try out Magic Spoon. Go to magicspoon.com forward slash Mind Pump. You'll automatically get a great discount, uh, plus free shipping. By the way, there's a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, you'll get a full refund. By the way, don't forget to use the code Mind Pump. You will be happy though. Then I talked about plant proteins. And if you're going to use vegan proteins, let's say you have an intolerance to whey or dairy like I do, uh, but you want to use plant proteins, you want to go with a blend. It gives you a better amino acid profile and it's much more effective. And of course, our favorite protein blend that's, that's a vegan protein is Organifi. It's also organic. This is a company we've been working with for a long time. Uh, very reputable, great supplements. Again, they have a great vegan protein powder. If you want to use the Mind Pump discount, do this. Go to Organifi, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for a full 20% off. Then we talked about how I am going to be uh, signing a book deal to write a book yeah. representing Mind Pump. That's kind of Scary and exciting at the same time. I'm pumped. And then we talked about the Astros and how they are now paying the price for cheating uh, in the sport of baseball. Uh, yeah. Then we got into the, the questions. Here was the first one. This person says, look, how do you use supersets? Supersets are, you might have heard us talk about them. They're in a lot of our programs like MAPS Split. Uh, what are supersets? Why are they valuable? What are the best muscle groups to apply them to? Super. The next question, this person says, uh, how do I take advantage of using different angles when I'm lifting? So what's the value of changing angles and exercises and when should I do that? The next question, this person says, what are your favorite exercises to increase your sense of balance? So if you want to improve your balance, we talk a little bit about how to do that. And the final question, this person says, what are some things that people in their 20s need to hear about when it comes to training and nutrition? So if you're in your 20s uh, and you you think you know it all, uh, you don't. <laughs> we help Which is a common you. thought. No, we, we try yeah. to help you out with things that we think are valuable to people in your age group. Also, 48 hours left for our massive MAPS split program discounts, 50% off. Now, MAP Split is a an advanced workout program. It's six days a week in the gym, extremely effective. It is a spotty part split routine done the right way. The program comes with exercise demos. We tell you exactly what to do, follow the different uh, phases. You're going to get great results. Again, it's advanced. If you like to go to the gym a lot, you'll love this program. It's half off. Okay, You have 48 hours left. Here's how you get that 50% off discount. Go to mapssplit.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-P-L-I-T.com and use the code SPLIT50. 
50. That's S P L I T 50. No space for that discount. Get that sexy spod. Dude, I got I got to tell you guys something. So, Courtney was filling out some paperwork and they were asking for like business information for my business. And so she went down uh, the Google rabbit hole of trying to see if we had like a an actual phone number that that she could put down for us and uh, this kind of led in a direction of like all these different links and and there was this one link on there that was like Basically, it was like Adam's net worth and like celebrity Mine? info. Yeah, it says Adam. You specifically, <laughs> I not it us. Up. You. I looked it up. Justin told me it says Adam Schaefer's net worth. What? Yes. Yeah, dude. That's online? Yeah. So we we have something we want to talk to you about. Yeah, we do. We, get, okay. we have some information we need. Yeah, uh, because if it's true, dude. Well, pull we, this up. Let me see, Doug. What yeah, are you yeah, not yeah, telling yeah. us, bro? Doug, what, do I, what do I, what do you search? It says, it's, first off, it says your net worth is $36 million. $36 million? <laughs> $36 million? <laughs> yeah. I was like, man. Yeah. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Dude, Adam, Adam's been closing <laughs> deals left and right. We have not been keeping track, so... Look, look up let there. Me see, let me see. Let me see. I'm yeah. like... It's, it's got some... It's, some information is accurate. It says you have yeah. one sister, which is... That's you not do, right. but not... You have more than one sister. Right. What is it? My birth sign's wrong. It says you're yeah. 35. Let's see if there's is, any... My birth date's wrong. Oh, who does Is there anything right here? Let's see who it's... Nothing. Look at the net worth. What does it say there, Doug? I'm just like, who... Oh, it says one to five million. Oh, it says. Yeah, no, I, I saw another one that said thirty-six million. Oh, oh yeah, that's the wrong one. There was wow. one that was like, yeah, it was, and it had more accurate information about like where you're located, like Katrina, like all, everybody was in there. Oh, dude, that's so weird. And so I was just like, who, who's putting this out there? And also, is this true? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the ad- questioning you. I like the ads at the bottom. Look at the ads at the bottom. You all ass pics. Yeah, there's a picture of like. <laughs> So you know it's legit. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Photos Adam's liked the most. Right? Yeah, I'm like, this is likely. <laughs> yes. this, is, this is an Adam picture. <laughs> Stuff Adam's into. Yeah. Yes. Don't click those links, Doug. Oh, man. Oh, Adam. my God. How crazy is that? It was just that? so funny, dude. It's like, you never know what you find online. Dude, basically what it is is someone who listened to the show, gathered information, and then guessed yeah. on the right. Ra- they filled in the holes. You know what I'm saying? So he, they're like, Adam, yeah. he's probably- Really bad, though. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean the, the month of my birthday is wrong. The year is wrong. Look at that. A yeah. bunch of stuff on my Click network. on that. What click the on that. One out there. Where's it? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, look, hey, your hey, look at your picture, man. I mean, it's legit. How much does it say there, Doug? Four million? That, I think it said four. Well, that's yeah. a lot of yeah, orga- that's Organifi ads. Look at Organifi, huh? No, it did. <laughs> yeah, it did. Look at scroll down. Look at, look at scroll down. Look at oh, that. That's great. Oh, yeah. that's, oh hey. Want to know juice. how much money Adam makes? Check out Organifi. Well, at least this one's got pictures of dudes without their shirts on. Yeah. Too, <laughs> so it's a little more yes. accurate. <laughs> now we're getting hot. Now we're getting hot. Wow, look at all these. Yeah, yeah, isn't that weird? That is weird. You know what? I look it's all celeb you, dude. money. It's not me and Sal. What, what does that one say? How, does that, how much does that one oh, say? Oh, a little oh, video of me? There's a video when you were shredded. Remember, have you seen this video right here? I have. That's after uh, my first place yeah. win right there. You know, that video, I, but when, before you and I started talking- That guy was like doting on you yeah. because he was interviewing you. <laughs> no, no, no. Before, <laughs> before we ever talked about starting Mind Pump, when you and I were just talking through social media and when I sent you maps or whatever. Oh, see, yeah. this one's a little- <laughs> This one says your net worth- It's a big range right there. This one says 100 grand. Holy. 100 grand <laughs> One million, like that's somewhere like, in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, pretty much. But, oh. but that video of you getting interviewed after your first what was that your first pro win? Yeah, is that what? Okay. No, no, no. That's before. That's uh, that's I, what got you to be pro. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what got me qualified to go to nationals. So, uh, as an amateur, you have to take top three to go to nationals. From nationals, you have to take top two to go to pro. So okay. that was actually my first first place win. As an amateur. Okay. So I before you and I got on the phone and all that and we were talking through social media, that video closed me on sending you I forgot about this, by the way. I totally forgot about this. That video closed me on sending you maps to oh, have you. Oh, no review. kidding. Yes, because I you know, we have a lot of mutual friends and they, they would I would always hear about you and they would always say you gotta meet him. You guys would be work great together. So I found that video and I watched it and you the way you talked and the way you presented yourself, I was like, oh, I see yeah. what they're talking about. And then I sent you the- and Then you got it, all competitive and you're like, I have better lats. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, but- You know what? <laughs> <laughs> we uh, So funny you're bringing this up right now. So yesterday, uh, I don't know if you guys saw my story. I was, I was playing basketball um, uh, at the park. And oh, the one—the one with your—with your, your son. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. Can you please bring him in? Yeah, well, he's, 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 he's got—he's got, he's got basketball. Sal, he's got basketball can't practice. Handle it. He's yeah. too cute. I yeah. can't even do yeah. this anymore. <laughs> so, I'm at—I'm at the park. I'm playing basketball. Uh, Katrina comes down, 
And uh, you know, this is how this is how I'm starting to indoctrinate him. Right, I'm having him just see me play. I like ball. how you, and you're accurate with what you're calling it. Yeah, indoctrination. <laughs> it is. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the brain. I'm not gonna. Yeah, starts. I'm not gonna force it on him yeah. or tell him he has to play. He's just gonna see a lot of. It. Then we come back home. We watch freaking the the Warriors play later on that night. You know, so this mm-hmm. is got a jersey coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is how my me hoping that he's gonna want to play basketball. But anyways, <clears throat> I'm playing. Katrina comes down, shoots little hoops with me, and then t- uh, takes him off. And uh, I'm by myself, and up walks this like this little kid all by himself, carrying his ball. It looks like it's his grandma sitting over at the picnic bench to watch him. And he's like, "Can I? Can I play with you?" How old is he? Uh, twelve. Okay, so he's twelve. You years didn't old. let him beat you in front of your son, right? <laughs> he's like, he's like, yeah, can we play? Some? He actually asked me to play one on one. He goes, "Can we play some one on one?" And I'm like, "Okay." Just swatting. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> totally. Like, get out of my house. D-ing him up hard, dude. <laughs> I totally try harder. Totally whooped up on this kid. <laughs> no, the the funny part was, uh, great kid, great little Muslim kid. He's telling me all about his religion, telling me about his parents, his his brother, his uh, his sister, and I mean, just a motor mouth. This kid's talking like crazy to me, right? We're just probably a good half hour, forty five minutes. We're hanging out and playing basketball together, and I I'm getting ready to leave, and he goes, "What was your name again? Are you are you on social media?" And I go. I'm actually a social media star. I'm a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't say it like I, that. I did. I swear to God, I did. Yes, I did. I just wanted. To, I just wanted to see what this. I go. I'm a social media star. <laughs> social he goes, media star. He goes. What? Are you serious? I go. Yeah. No, I'm serious. He's like, how many followers do you have? So here comes. After uh, I said that, like now I have to prove everything. That's the currency, right? Oh there, yeah, dude. Yeah. So I he asked me how many followers on Instagram I had. How many people comment on that? Do I have a, a YouTube channel? Wow. How, yeah, how many people are on my YouTube channel? How much money do I make? How many cars do I drive? Yeah. He wanted to know all this. How super- many sponsors you have? Like, yeah. Yeah. Bro, this is a future little <laughs> champion, it sounds wow. like. He but had the guts to go up to an adult man, ask him to play basketball, and then he's asking yeah. all these questions. Oh, he I like business-related questions. I like oh, this kid. Yeah, he was, he, I mean, I, he'd ask how many cars, I'd say how many cars I had, then he'd be like, which ones? Tell me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get all like stuttery, like, uh, 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 right. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, that's awesome oh it's hilarious that's dude. fun dude yeah, yeah. I like that I like seeing kids that are not afraid to <laughs> to, to talk to adults and ask questions like that you know oh no I mean? he and he did he pressured yeah. me to follow too he's like will you follow me back if I follow you and I'm like yeah, no dude. he did yes he did I, oh, swear, I swear to god uh, dude. Champion. I lost a little credibility though when he asked if I had TikTok and I said no uh, he's like oh Oh, you lost <laughs> it? Oh, that's yeah. funny. I got yeah, I got shamed for that before because I was like trying to get trying it out, and some kid was like, "Oh, you're on TikTok, <laughs> lame." <laughs> I'm like, really? Too I thought old. you guys were into this. Yeah, Too old. <laughs> it's like that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. that's why I won't get on you're, there. This isn't for you. Yeah, you know. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so you guys know you guys know today as of the recording of this episode, it's the first day of uh, Lent. Today, oh, is that going on right today's now? Today's when Lent starts. Um, and uh, what it's, are you going to be what, practicing it? I am. Now, it's uh, this is what's interesting about it. So um, regardless of whether or not you're Catholic or Christian or religious, uh, I think it's it's a very interesting and important practice. I know people to, that participate in it that are not. I, yeah. I, because it's so valuable. Yeah, I agree. Like, if you look at all the religions in the world and all the different cultures, the, the wise people, they all talk about uh, detachment in some form. And that's what Lent is kind of about, right? So forget the religious aspect. Find something that you feel attached to. And how do you know you're attached to something? If it if it makes you cringe to think about avoiding it for 40 days, right? So if you think, like, if I tell you, like, hey, no coffee for 40 days, and you go, oh, no, I can't do that. That's probably the thing you should you should detach from or Why whatever. Why are you pointing at me, dude? No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little sideways. <laughs> But well, I mean, in reality, I, I don't think there's uh, anybody who can honestly say there's not something that they should probably uh, scale back on, whether sure. it's caffeine or your phone. drugs or cigarettes or right. phone or television, sugar or, or yeah. whatever. So my kids, you know, and it's I, I talked to this, talked to my kids about this, and I was so proud of my kids for picking things that I know would be difficult for them because in the past, like maybe two years ago or whatever, I would tell my kids. Hey, what do you want to give up for Lent? And my kids would say something Vegetables. like Vegetables. Yeah, like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh you little shits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to run anymore. You know, something stupid like that. You yeah. already run. But this time they were really good. So my daughter gave up uh, rice. She loves white rice. So she's like, I'm not going to, because she, she's understanding now the whole attachment thing. Like, okay, I'm going to detach from it. Yeah. My son says he's going to go to bed at nine o'clock at night every single night, which I'm. Wow. I, yeah, we'll see. If he, yeah. if he if he succeeds at that, well, he just like gets home at like six or seven, right? So he only has like a few hours. He's to a say. night owl too. The kid yeah. loves to. He hates going to sleep. But he That's said crazy. he said he's going to give up. Uh, you know, he's going to go to bed early. 
So I was just thinking about what a what a remarkable practice. I think everybody should do something like that. Again, forget the religious aspect of it, but detach from something you know you have you're, you're attached to, and just do it for you know whatever thirty days, forty days, whatever, and then watch the growth that you know comes out of that. I think it's a really really good. Practice. Oh, I think you, yeah. one of the things you start to realize. I, I mean, and I try and practice something similar uh and i did i do it just whenever i feel like i've seen it, you do this yeah yep. right it, it, if anything gets a hold of me i don't have like a certain set days it's not called lent it's not 40 days it's it's like you know i, I try and challenge myself to be self-aware and when i catch myself doing something habitually that i know is not serving my body uh, or serving me period uh, I try my best to like, okay, like I'm not going to do that. And mm -hmm. just, it's not because I'm demonizing it because I, I don't think there's value to it or, or that it's, you know, anything like that. It's just simply, I want to be in control at all times. And I don't ever want anything in my life to feel like, like it owns you. Yes. And so I, I think it's a very important practice. And I think more people, uh, should do something like this. And, and I think it's unfortunate that, uh, we just dismiss, stuff because it's attached to religion and so it's like oh god it's religion uh you know so it's wrong so fuck it don't do it for religious purposes you know become self-aware as a person enough to recognize that there's certain things in your life that you allow to get a hold of you and you know when you and the, what's amazing is when you do start to cut it off or detach from it for a little bit you realize like oh wow what a grasp it had and then all of a sudden you notice like oh wow i have better relationships oh, with people yeah. or it frees up this it's, or it's also super empowering because when you feel like something has a grasp of you and then you say okay i'm going to i'm going to cut this out ooh this is going to be challenging but then you succeed at doing it you feel very empowered and confident. You feel like you're far more powerful. Like, okay, right. I can do. Like, it had some sort of control over you. That's that's why it's part of every spiritual practice. That's a hundred. Every spiritual practice, every major spiritual practice, whether it's Buddhism, Islam, uh, you know, Judaism, Christianity, even the the smaller, you know, less popular spiritual practices, they all talk about detachment because there's a that spiritual power that comes from detaching from material things. So you could say something like, uh, no TV. For 30 days. Like if you're listening right now and, and I say to you, try cutting TV out for 30 yeah. days and you get this feeling inside of you, like, no way. Just don't cut out podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah that's, what, am I, what am I doing? We want our downloads, <laughs> guys. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. But you get the point and it's a very, uh, it's a very good practice to have. What's the carryover to fitness and to nutrition? Well, it's a huge carryover because part of fitness and nutrition success is altering your behaviors and being able to change things that you that have a little bit of power over you. You know, it's it's funny whenever I would train a client and I would look at their nutrition and you could tell which foods had power over them because I would suggest like, hey, maybe we should cut the bagel out that you have every morning. And you'd see the look on their face, like I have a bagel every single morning. Yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> and then you realize it's there's there's a there's a stronger connection and attachment here. Mm -hmm. And okay, we won't do that just yet, but I'm gonna mark that down because this is something that we may want to kind of revisit. And then when they're able to do that, uh, moving forward, just the behavioral changes that you can incorporate. Oh man, it's, it's, it's amazing. So I was just thinking about that this morning. Like, you know, everybody should, should think about practicing some form of detachment regardless of, you know, religious affiliations or Agreed. not. Yeah. Anyway, another thing too, uh, this morning, have you guys ever incorporated, um, intra set or intra workout weighted stretching Yeah, in your routines? You have? What's yeah. your experience with it? No, I haven't. Um, I, I see I get a big pump from it, uh, but I haven't done it long enough to be able to say, okay, I noticed these great changes like where I saw you know, major growth or I saw a, a huge strength gains from it. But I do notice uh, the pump and the workout. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do notice that. Uh, and maybe, uh, my experience at least, uh, less sore. Hmm. Um, and I don't know what, what if that is from the, the stretching portion of that, but I, I know it's a little bit better pumps, and I notice that I get probably less sore from it. But. So I know Pakulski was a big yes. uh, proponent of it, yes. um, and there's other, other bodybuilders, smart bodybuilders that talk about it, and I respect Pakulski. He's always got really, really good information. He's, he's one of the smartest uh, pro bodybuilders I've ever met. I've also read studies in the past on weighted stretching, and what they'll do is they'll do intraset. So what weighted stretching basically is is – Let's say I'm working out my chest that day um, in between exercises or even at the end of my workout when I'm done with my chest, I'll get like 
let's say normally I do chest flies with 45 pounds, 45 pound dumbbells. I'll take 25 pound dumbbells. So I don't want to go as heavy as I do when I work out because it's mm. too much. But I'll go 25 pound dumbbells and then I'll let them bring my arms down on the fly and I'll sit in that stretched, weighted stretched uh, position. And you still have to resist it so you are like creating tension. A, a little bit, right? A little bit. Oh, yeah. I'm letting it stretch me, but I'm not like completely relaxed because my arms will flop or whatever. Yeah, I'm but, with, it, it, but it's holding me in the stretch position for about 30 seconds. Mm. So that's kind of how you do it. And studies will show that when you incorporate that in your routine, your gains are better. You build more muscle. So it, it adds more hypertrophy. I mean, I, I mean, I have a theory on that. Hmm. I think that, uh, and I think the reason why we probably see why the studies show this is I really feel like very few people put a lot of emphasis on the isometric portion of an exercise. Yeah. We talk all about eccentric and concentric, so the positive and the negative of an exercise, very few people put any sort of uh, energy towards uh, isometric exercises. So I think programming that in itself would show probably similar or as yeah. or pretty close to the same benefits as the interest that we're, I think they've found a crazy uh, a creative way to program it and add some weight in there to help people. Yeah, you're gaining more strength and in range that way by by creating this isometric tension. I, it's interesting. I don't know if like extrinsic is is a word or not, but like I think of it in terms of like creating tension to kind of like it, like intrinsic tension you you produce versus this is like an outside stimulus that's like placing you in that position that you're fighting the resistance like against it. Yeah, those are really good observations. I would agree on that because if you think about when people do apply isometric uh, you know uh, contractions in their programming they typically apply it to the to the contraction to the shortened position right that's more common right so someone would say oh at the end of my chest workout I'll squeeze my pecs as hard as I can and hold that for you know right. 15 seconds rarely does anybody say I hold in a deep weighted stretch for 30 seconds so I, I would agree I think it, it, it probably is and I, I started incorporating it uh, this morning. And I, so it's too soon for me to really tell, mm -hmm. but a hundred percent the pump. I get a massive yeah. pump from yeah. doing. I it. noticed the pump right I'm away. Sure. But I mean, the other thing is too. So not only are you uh, you getting the benefits from uh, programming isometrics, which very few people do, anyways. You're also programming it, like you said, in the stretch position, which we know that's the weakest point. Mm -hmm. So probably has the. Uh, greatest opportunity for growth and change. Yes, right? yes. If you're really good at uh, strength training, you've been lifting weights for a really long time, uh, in the uh, the fully contracted position, you're probably you know in the upper, upper part of your potential because you're always lifting and fully contracting, right? But how often do you isometrically hold in a fully stretched position? Yeah, you've probably, expanded your strength curve. Right. Yeah. You probably rarely ever do that. So you're getting the benefits of isometrics. And then you, in a to on top of that, you're also addressing the weakest part uh, of the movement uh, through isometrics. I think that that's where we're getting this, where the studies are starting to show like the, the benefits. Yeah, and, the, and then the Soviets, the Soviets were big on this. The Soviets talked about this, uh, this benefit. There was one uh, study in particular done on birds uh, that was inc incredible. Where they had a bird, where they did a weighted uh, like stretch across the mm -hmm. the, the pec that, muscle of the bird or whatever, and it just kept it there. You know, I don't remember for how long. And the hypertrophy that the bird saw on that wing uh, was exceptional. And then they started applying it to athletes. And really, the, the idea behind it is, it's you're not you you're you're as you're holding the stretch for thirty seconds. You're finding that it gets deeper mm -hmm. and deeper and deeper while you hold, and it's painful. It's not a, a fun feeling to hold that type of a stretch for you know for for 30 seconds. The pump is incredible. Here's the other part of it that I like. If in terms of in increasing range of motion flexibility, it's also a great time to do that. One of the best ways to apply static stretching, in my opinion, at the end of a workout. You know that's what we have in, in Maps Prime, right? Where we don't recommend static stretching before you work out, but at the end when the muscle's pumped, go ahead and throw a, a long static stretch on the muscle, get more of a range of motion, and then you get some of these these muscle building effects. So I'm a, I started doing it. I'll let you guys know, you know, what I get from it because I'm gonna start doing it on a on a we regular did a good, basis. I think we did a good YouTube video with Ben on this. We did. Okay, I thought yeah, so. Yeah, he talked about it in in actually one of our more, one of our more popular videos. So uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, yeah. He did it with yeah, a and, cool and experiment. With I that. went on a little kick for a while where I was doing it. I like like I said, I noticed the pump from it. I thought maybe it was helping recovery. 
but my my theory on it probably increasing strength is simply I I'd be interested to see if I really if I were to program just purely isometric stuff in there and especially in the stretch position to your programming I think that would show benefits for most people. Yeah, I, w- I would totally agree, but it's not nearly as important as like your programming, your ex- you know the exercises you pick. It reminds me of like BFR. You know, there's value there too. Why right. don't I always do it? Because it's a little bit of value. Yeah. You know, it's not as valuable as me making sure I do the right exercises, the right form. 100%. You know, all that other stuff. Anyway, did you guys see the, the, the bill that Utah just passed? No. Mm-hmm. I didn't. Huh? You didn't see that? So they, dis- they just decriminalized uh, polygamy. What? what? Yeah, so it's decriminalized now. So they had laws. I didn't even know it was actually, I didn't know it was Well, yeah, that's why I, like a lot of the families moved down to Mexico. Right, I don't know. I don't yeah, know about that. I, I remember seeing like you know when I was in that like cult uh, watch sort of uh, mentality. And I was like, I was <laughs> you like, paused there for a yeah. while. When I was in that cult, I was not <laughs> actually in the cult. Yeah, I was watching the, out for them. Like, the what, what are all the cults yeah, yeah, out there? I need to be aware of. You know, so there was one that uh, was definitely like a whole. Uh, I don't know if it was two or three families moved down to to Mexico and they were actually having problems because the the cartels, um, you know, they're they're in cartel like territory and so they've had to actually fight them off and like there's some people that have been killed like in those communities down there. Oh, that, that's that great. Moved down there. Well, I know Utah has a huge uh, Mormon population. Yeah. Now I know that the current uh, Mormonism as it currently stands doesn't promote uh, polygamy, but the old you know, Mormon uh, religion or whatever, that was part of their religion was, you know, you have lots of different wives God, or with, whatever. With polygamy over there and Mormonism so popular there, I would I would uh, venture to think that probably 60% of our population comes from out of there then. What do you, what do you mean? Because all, the- <laughs> <laughs> all the children uh, they have you having, yeah, dude. Yeah. I mean, you got three wives, you could probably pump out at least 15, 20 kids, you know? Yeah, I yeah. think most Mormons are targeting like 10. I think that's like most of their goal. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of kids well, coming well, out they of that did, state. They did pass the bill that decriminalized polygamy me between consenting adults, which to be honest with you, it's weird that we had a law that said it was illegal between consenting adults to begin with. And the whole reason for the law in the the beginning was, you know, because they had underage marriages. And I honestly think it has more to do with uh, taxes. I honestly think that they want it. They don't, they, they, there's a lot of, once you start to open up actual marriage to multiple people, mm-hmm. you could see how people might more, take advantage. More money for the state. Yeah, like it would be, they'd start taking advantage of stuff like that. But it's interesting. That's right? it. So that's the only state though that would allow polygamy. Um, I don't think they allow people to get married, but I think they're. It's. I don't think it's. It, it's. It's. Uh, it's like mushrooms in Oakland, bro. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Not, yeah. They're not gonna okay. throw you in prison or, for uh, having decriminalize it. Decriminalize. Yeah. Exactly. So they're not yeah, throwing they're you not, in prison. They're, they're not, not promoting it, but yeah. they're not like handcuffing you. Yeah. I don't know if it's if it's legal. Any are there states that allow it? Oh no, it's illegal. Illegal in all fifty states. That's what I thought. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it's it's decriminalized. Doesn't mean it's legal. Yeah. That just means it's not a felony or whatever it was. I think really it is to kind of because you know how uh, we are so adamant about like not allowing these cults to to come out of you know the woodworks and and I don't know like it it tends to kind of start uh, these compounds like we paid a lot of attention to these compounds when you start like isolating yourself and then like everybody's sort of just you know doing their own thing like the government doesn't like that. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, how was your last um, class? Oh, it was, oh, yeah, was yeah no, it was good. Um, it was interesting because uh, like this time it was all about acting and, and becoming a character. And uh, like there was just so much about it that I was like, man, this is so foreign to me. Like I'm not like, I don't think like that. Like they're like to be able to portray something and like animate myself with my body, everything. So it was all kind of leading up to this point of, you know, being able to kind of like get in front of people, like have something to say, but now you have to have like some kind of narrative behind it. And then you also have to pantomime, uh, you know, what you're doing. So people understand what you're doing. And so it was actually really cool. It was like a, like totally out of like a normal thing for me. Is this, so. are you acting in front? Are you going up by yourself and then you have to do it in front of everybody? Type yeah. Of deal? Well, actually that was only one time in the class where you had to get in front and then become like an expert about a subject you didn't know anything about. Uh, which that was terrifying. That was probably the most terrifying for me because, you know, that's a deep rooted, you know, like fear of mine is like getting up there, not knowing what you're going to talk about. (laughs) Oh shit. You know? And so pretending like you do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Pretending like you do just bullshitting your way through it. So, but it was actually, it was great. That that had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing that. But uh, this last part, it was, 
four, you, you get up there with like three other people and they're, they're trying to actually show like status. So you, we started out with a, a clear example of, of like, uh, I'm a king or a queen and you know, the rest of, of you guys are, are servants. And so like you, your whole role was to try and please the king or whatever. So they didn't kill you. Mm. And so that it showed like, how did you please the king? The, <laughs> I juggled <laughs> <laughs> naturally. You know? What were you juggling? Uh, air balls. Oh, okay. you know? Yeah. yeah. I, was, I, was, I was miming it. So where, where do you, where, how many, first of all, how many people are in the class? Uh, there was like 25 people. Is it always 25? Is it always the same 25? Or are they different? Yeah, there's just usually one or two that doesn't show up. Okay, but, so uh, but this is the same group that you've been going through yeah, this whole same time. group. Now, where do you rank? I don't think they have... I mean, there's no rank. Come like, on, you know your shit, bro. I know no. if I go play basketball with 25 people, where I land. Okay. Am I like fucking the best? Am no. I the worst? Am I in the middle? Where are you at? No, I'm like, I'm like good on some of the aspects, right? Like some of the stuff that's like like super random where like you have to come up with, with a subject or you have to come up with an idea. I'm, yeah. I'm really good at that. But when it comes to like the acting part, like I felt like really clunky and like there was people in there that were like good actors. Yeah. Like, they, like I could tell they had like some kind of training, you know, where they were like, uh, they became this other, other person. Yeah. Like totally like, out of, like out of nowhere. I'm like, oh. so you're like 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, probably. That's fair. Somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? Like, I got, I got some strengths. I got some weaknesses. But. Yeah, well, that's kind of cool though that there's actually people that are pretty talented. So I, I mean, I feel like I learn better when I'm watching somebody who's far better at their craft than I am. So I right. can like pick up on things that they're doing. Are you learning stuff that way? Like when you see somebody like that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. There was like little tiny things. Like you start to pay attention to the way that, uh, like for instance, uh, if if somebody had a, a certain way that they walked with their gait like like one one leg was they're pretending to be a little bit longer than the other leg and so it like gave them this certain kind of shift and then that like gave you a lot more information about the character like oh there was probably something that happened or like you know maybe they were born with some kind of deformity or you know or whatever like they were just doing like little things to add more depth to, to their characters oh interesting. And, like i was going way too general uh, you know like okay. and i'm like oh shit you could get way more specific like uh with like how you're 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 portraying yourself like an accent yeah, or something like that. Yeah, something, just anything. Like you think, uh, and and the instructor Jeff, he was great. He was like bringing up all these examples of like, like think about if you were counting in your head to ten as you were acting and as you're interacting with these other people, how would that affect the way that you interact with these people? Uh, like if I'm sitting there like consciously trying to count the 10 while you're talking, I'm going to get irritated with you trying to interrupt me or like tell me something, or I'm not going to listen or, you know, it's going to affect my timing or, you know, there's just like little things like that, that you, 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 you sort of take that into account. What do you think has been the most valuable thing that you've taken away? Cause you're now on like, this is like the, what the sixth class or so you've done. Eighth. Eighth class. Yeah, so I'm, I'm done. This is the, the... Oh, that was the final? That was the, the level one. I'm done, yeah. Oh, okay. So what was the greatest takeaway of this entire course? I think really it was there's exercises that are available for you to, uh, you know, be able to really access your right brain uh, more specifically and, and to, to, to be able to react and... and and, and speak without like getting it all muddied up with with analyzing it, you know. And so I could I could say what's on my mind, and then get better at saying what was on my mind before like being rational about it and like being logical. And you know, it's really hard to to um, you know filter that out, like because we're so conditioned to to everything has to make sense. You know, everything has logic behind it. Everything has to like be structured all the time, and to be more creative and ridiculous is a hard space to get into. A lot so of it's times. like not, it's like learning how to not overly scrutinize yourself when you're communicating. Yes. Yeah. That's a big one. Which it's is like, big for me. Yeah. When you talk to people who tend to get anxious, uh, when they talk to in social situations or whatever, what they'll often say is I'll start a community, I'll start a conversation and then I'll start listening to myself, have the conversation. And then I get all yes. weirded out I, I or whatever all the time. Yeah. Rather than just having the conversation. <laughs> it's interesting. Acting actors are, are interesting to me. I, I, on one hand, really good actors are, are interesting to watch. On the other hand, it's like, I don't trust you because yeah, you're so good I know. at pretending, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. who are you? you yeah, know do you saying? really know who you are if you've been like all these characters so well, often? Well, dude, you ever watch act like famous? You ever watch um, John Travolta's Instagram? 
Oh, he's he's bizarre. Fucking awkward. Super. Bizarre. I don't think he knows how to be not like not yeah. act. Like yeah. when you watch him on, you're like, that's weird. But when he acts, he's great. You right. know what I mean? It's so weird. Hey there, Instagrammer. Well, so, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of those guys are are more comfortable being another character than themselves. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 uh, I don't know, strange stuff. Anyway, what do you guys, I, I, what do you guys think about this hand gripper I've been messing with? Is it working? Well, you know what? So so this serves as two two. I'll put it here so you can see it on camera. There's there's two values to to this for me. One, it helps control my ADD because I have terrible distractibility. Yeah. And two, I've been squeezing and messing with the hand gripper now for the past couple weeks. Legit made me stronger, hundred percent. I go lift weights and I feel like my grip is just solid, way yeah. stronger. So it's just something I mess with. I don't like work out with it. I just squeeze it here and there yeah, well, or whatever. You know, why don't you reach out and try and see if we can get sponsored by them? <laughs> no, I know. Adam's like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, where's your business brain? <laughs> yeah, dude. Come on, guy. Yeah. Hey, speaking of business, I brought up some macro comparisons for uh, one, for our sponsor, um, Magic Spoon. So I'm going to compare Fruit, oh, fruit Loops. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Tell uh, me because I, I you guys did, know I used to I used to eat bowls of Fruit Loops. So I did this, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. It's pretty. This is what got me so hyped about the, the product, dude. Yeah, so it's, wait till you – I can't wait to hear the numbers. So this is – so I'm comparing the like Fruit Loops to the – Fruity cereal. Fruity flavored yeah, which is Magic what it tastes Spoon like. cereal, which and it tastes, again, phenomenal. So – this is now a serving on Magic Spoon and on cereal boxes. By the way, is three quarters of a cup, which is nothing, right? Because yeah. I, I because most people eat what two cups? Yeah, at least? not even a, my my son who's seven months would eat more than that now, dude. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's nothing, dude. So this is a small, you know, what they would consider serving. But the reality is, most people eat at least two cups, or if you like Justin, a punch bowl, yeah, uh, of cereal. <laughs> I, I'm totally guilty. So here's the so the macros on Fruit Loops is one gram of protein. Oh wait, wait, wait back up. Hold on. Are you doing I just mean, a serving? Just the three quarters of a cup of serving. Of oh, Loops, see, I like Loops. to do I like to do like what a real bowl of cereal would be like two, oh, two well, and a half cups. You want me to do math right now? Uh, never mind. <laughs> Don't right. do it. So you, right. well, Thank it you. just it's it's it, the, I mean the bigger the bowl, the more extreme the the discrepancy is. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And and let's be real, True. nobody is pouring a three quarter cup bowl of cereal. You're bare minimum you're i mean imagine right now in your head a a two cups uh measuring cup even that's not that big mm -hmm. yeah. most mm -hmm. bowls are at, at least another quarter or a half size of that all so. right all right so i'll start doing a little bit of math here for you okay so uh at least double it you yeah know? so double yeah. what the serving is right three quarters mm -hmm. of a cup so fruit loops would have two grams of protein so two grams of protein and that's not including the milk that's just the cereal Carbohydrates, yes. it would have 40 grams of carbohydrates wow. yeah. and uh, about 20 grams of sugar, right? So Oof. Magic Spoon would have 24 grams of protein, which is a you know milk protein isolate and whey protein isolate, very high quality protein, 16 grams of carbohydrates. So the difference is between 40 grams of carbs and 16, big difference. Here's the biggest difference, 20 grams of sugar in the Fruit Loops, Zero. None. Zero. Yeah. Zero grams of sugar. Did in you say two grams of protein for only uh, two? Right. Versus twenty-four. Oh, versus twenty-four. Yeah. So get huge, out of here. Huge difference in the obviously way more protein in the magic. And spoon. it tastes bomb. Damn. And zero. Yeah. What kind of magic are they doing? Like legit <laughs> wizardry. What is going yeah. on over there? That they make it taste uh, taste that good. No, it's it's uh, quickly becoming one of the favorite sponsors for yeah. sure. And I'm then and then speaking of of protein, um, another thing I was uh, I was writing an article on on protein, which led me down the path of you know, uh, you know studies and articles and whatever. And the bottom line is that animal proteins are just generally superior. To plant proteins, it's just hands down. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, I know vegans don't like to hear that. They don't but like to hear that. It's totally true. You have to, in order to get the same, uh, you know, effects of animal protein, you have to eat a lot more plant protein. If you eat a lot of plant protein, then you can make up for the difference. And but don't then you, you have, have to have? Calories. Don't you also have to have a variety of different uh, sources for plant protein? I was just gonna say, but let's say you don't want animal protein for whatever reason because nine nine out of ten uh, protein shakes that are animal derived or are, are milk derived which is nothing wrong with it whey protein is extremely high quality very very good but if you're intolerant to dairy like I am I can't do whey protein so I have to go with plant protein in order to maximize the uh, the effects of your plant protein you want to have a blend you want you don't want to have a single source of plant protein you want to have a combination of plant proteins that complement each other so you have a more balanced 
amino acid profile, mm-hmm. higher amounts of leucine, which plant proteins tend to be low in, but you can find some plant proteins that are high in leucine, lower in other amino acids, but then you combine it with other plant proteins that are higher in those missing amino acids. So when you have a, a, a plant protein blend, now you're getting closer to the the benefits of you know animal protein. Now, have they figured out what the like optimal blend looks like? Like if it's sunflower seed with soy with what what is Some the algae? Or what is yeah? What is like? Do, do we know like what the the best blend is? Or well, what? Organifi has a really good blend. If you if you if you message Organifi, you can get you can ask them for an amino acid profile of their of their protein. Um, but they have a really good blend. They they combine, I think, three or four different plant proteins. Maybe Doug can bring it up for me because I don't want to I don't want to miss be misquoted. Um, but they have a really really good blend, and they've done the right uh, the right thing. So again, if you're going to have a plant protein, because here's what happens: you hear Mind Pump, and you hear I need to eat you know 0.6 to 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight to reap the benefits of a high protein diet. Well. That's based off of animal protein. Oh wow! When they do those studies, yeah, uh, that's interesting. It's, 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 now, so that means if you're pure plant based, based, you're going to need to be on the higher end of that mm. to to get to, you know to derive a lot of those benefits. Yeah. But if you do a protein blend, then you're closer to the the effects that you'd get from uh, you know from plant uh, from uh, animal protein. What is the blend there, Doug? Yeah, it's hard to read here. Uh, they have an image. I've seen it before. Yeah, they do somewhere. It's organic pea protein, okay. organic quinoa protein, organic pumpkin seed protein, and then they have some enzymes as well added to it. That's the other thing, too. One thing that I like that they did is they added uh, enzymes, which will help the assimilation. But pea protein is actually a decent plant protein. It's one of the better ones uh, if you had to pick you know, one. They don't have soy in there, which I like. Yeah. Uh, not ne- not ne- soy is necessarily bad. But um, soy uh, can have some potential estrogenic. It's a small, you know, small chance of this, but it's still some people need to be careful with soy because of the potential estrogenic effects yeah. uh, of soy. So like is having it, tons is of soy could cause typically GMO, or is there like some organic soy that you can, you can get? get organic soy, but it's usually GMO. There is. I yeah, thought right. there wasn't. I know. Uh, I thought most of it's like I don't know GMO. where you'd find it, I, but I'm sure that there's soy that's non-GMO, but uh, most soy is. I thought I read that that there maybe it was like a high number, like eighty or ninety percent of yeah, soy. It's was. it's one of the there. Yeah, uh, Doug found a few of them, but they're not nearly as uh, as as popular. Yeah, soy is uh, is one of the top GMO crops, right? In That's America, what I thought. yeah. If, if not, and... if not the, uh, the what is corn? I think corn. Is the, yeah, it was the other. Yeah, yeah. Corn is the top. Hey, I wanted to ask you. I don't know if you're okay with talking about this on the podcast. Doug can just edit it. If not, um, where where are you at right now with Hachette? Are you uh, are we? Are oh, you, are I see. You, are you signed still on it? No, when's when's no, the no. book start? When you when you start? And yeah, arrive? no, we haven't signed yet. We're just looking. We're still going through on the contract. God, so. what that was a process, huh? Oh yeah. So this is for this is to write a book. I don't know if we should talk too much about it. Uh, um, you know, because nothing's been uh, finalized or, or or signed or whatever. But yeah, we're in the process of. Of uh, getting that finalized, and then we'll put out. Mind Pump will put out a book. Oh, exciting! Are yeah. you excited or what? Yeah, super excited, dude. No, no, I'm excited for it. Yeah, you. it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an interesting process. Uh, I've never done that before. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've written blogs, which is a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> those so, can turn into books. Yeah, as they so. say, it's just yeah. like 500 of those put together. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's all it is. No big deal. Just slap oh, yeah. a few together. <laughs> but, Copy paste. Yeah, the whole process is gonna be interesting. But yeah, the, the process of working with um, publishers is. Uh, you know, we, I have an agent that helps with all that. Thank God I do, dude. It's a complicated. Do you th- do you think it's more complicated because uh, because of our business, or it, would it be a, would it be as complicated even if we had no no mind pump? It was just you writing a book. Is dude, it- I don't know any of the. I don't know. It, it, I, it, I'm we're totally unfamiliar with what that looks like. So, imagine going in, signing a contract, and you have zero familiarity with the the space, what that means, what it what's the standard. Uh, how that could potentially impact me. I had no idea. So working with someone who's experienced uh, was like invaluable. We ought to send Mike a gift for because I know it was Mike's agent that he sent over. Yeah, he recommended somebody to me. Which you have. You've expressed what a a lifesaver that's been. We should should do something nice for Mike just as a – because that's a solid move. I mean, it sounds like it's going to end up saving you a ton of money. It sounds like it'll also protect the business, like – a lot of things that maybe you would not have thought of. It's it, it's interesting too because we are a media company and we already have like published content and we'll publish more content. Typically, what publishers will say to somebody is they'll say, "We're going to sign you. You're going to write this book, 
But within this two-year period of the publishing of the book, you cannot produce any other written content that's similar. Which would fuck our fuck which, us. I mean, if I'm writing a book on health and fitness, <laughs> yeah, uh, like how would that how would that how would that be possible? We're obviously we're going right. to publish you know that's content on yeah. health and fitness. So it was a little bit different, I think, than, than, than you know what normal people would go through, or people who don't have a media company. Right, would, right. Would go through. Justin, you told me the other day you were uh, you brought up the Astros, the thing that I talked about maybe a couple yeah. weeks back about them cheating, them and cheating, and and so did more come out on this? Yeah. So they basically they kept their title, right? Like right. their their World Series title, and this is something that's like sort of aggravated like the entire league you know that they're able to keep their title and everything and so uh aubrey huff a, you know retired baseball uh player w like came out and i think it was on like tmz or whatever and was starting to he was he was basically saying that they should they should wear bulletproof vests going up to to bat that you know they were going to be in for like like getting beamed almost every every pitch i just oh. read an article on this i think six of them have been hit Already, yeah. So like, they're thinking that this is just going to keep continuing like the whole season. Like, and he was saying that like half joking, but half like serious. Like, you know what? Like, like they're not like okay with you guys like, you know, openly cheating and then getting away with it and also like maintaining your title. Oh, oh I didn't God. know. That I is didn't, so funny. I did not know that was happening. So they're so they're getting hit on purpose because they cheated. So the pitchers are like targeting them. Yeah, they're like, fuck you. No way. <laughs> and I get it. And the thing is, there's been waves of different types of cheating, but then, it, you know, people get punished for it. And they move on. You know, it's like, uh, it's an understanding that like what you can get away with, you can get away with, but then once you get caught, you have to own that you got caught. Well, that's okay. So it, it, this is such a- uh, Look at this article that in USA Today. The the Houston Astros could challenge the record for most hit by pitches in a season. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Hey, I mean, that's what you get. 100 I'm, mile an hour fastball is coming at you. I mean, <laughs> this subject's a little nuanced, right? Because sure. for uh, forever- um, in baseball, you've been trying to steal signs, yep. and that and that's a part of the game. It's a total fair part of the game. If you are a, a, on second base uh, and you can catch the sign that the catcher is tell, throwing the pitcher, you are doing your best to give a sign yes. to your batter to let him know, "Yo, change up." He brought coming. that up too, and that was like an understanding they had. It's like if you can hack, you know, like if you're on second base, you can see what those signs are. That was understood, but like this was using technology now. Well, and which they have a problem with exactly. So it's like they're kind of the first ones to really hack it with technology. Which this co this is very similar to uh, the trouble that the Patriots got in. You know, yeah. stealing the plays from. I mean, they had they were using. I think they had like cameras that were video recording, you know, other football teams' plays. <laughs> yes. But I mean, since the beginning of time, that used to be. I mean, your goal that's was the game. Yeah. yeah, the game was to try and get. That. And if you had an inside man or you knew somebody, I mean, that's part of the game. So now, in the past, has have they ever done before? We had like these cameras. Did they? Did anybody ever use binoculars? And of course, the, in the, out, yeah. in the totally. yeah. audience. Yeah, or of course. All these things have been have been messed yeah. with. That's why it's kind of this. You know how do you how do you punish them? And I'm not by no means am I defending the Patriots or defending the Astros for using technology to cheat, yeah. but I do understand as a league how you can't strip them of their title because this hasn't happened yet and you haven't laid down the law for it. And honestly, yeah. it's always been kind of uh, it's been an unspoken thing, a yeah. part of the part of the game. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. I know. And now, and so this is kind of like this, uh, but you know, this is like this is justice. Right? This is free market. This yeah. is what I like. You know, let the market correct itself. Now you're they're going to regulate by <laughs> beaming the shit out of yeah, them. Yeah, they're going to get their ass beamed every fucking day. <laughs> 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 Punishment. Yeah. We don't need authorities to come in and make more rules and shit like that. Don't worry. We're just going to scare the shit yeah, out of everybody. The players yeah. will handle this just fine. Yeah. <laughs> handle it, self-regulate. Yeah, so there you I go. Like that. First question is from Cyprian Bolin. How often do you use supersets and what muscle groups do you use them with? Are there any groups that are better suited to supersetting or is it good to mix them around every now and then? Oh, great question. You know, supersets have been a bodybuilding staple for a quite a long time. I think they achieved a lot of their popularity in the 70s during the golden era of bodybuilding. This is when you had uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger was dominating uh, that whole scene. So the idea behind a superset essentially is you do two exercises back to back. That's the right. the breakdown of a superset. Cut the rest in between. But there's there's a lot of value in, in different ways to do supersets. So that's like generally what they mean. But I like to personally use supersets as ways to combine a compound movement with an isolation movement 
to target a particular body part. So a good example would be supersetting bench press with flies, with flies right? Yep. So I did the bench press first. That's my compound movement. Then I go to flies to really hammer out and squeeze the pecs or reverse, do the flies first, then do the bench press. That's known as a pre-exhaust superset. The, the main benefits I see of them, honestly, it all boils down to getting an insane pump, yeah. getting lots of blood uh, to the muscle. I, I, it's a tool. I think there's a place for it. Uh, I think it's a great uh, a great way to build volume into your program. Uh, but I also think that you should scale up to it. So if I'm if I'm following like a a strength based program where I'm running like a five by five, I want to run that and I want to slowly start to add volume. When I get to a place where in an hour workout, I'm I'm starting to max out. Like I'm moving from exercise to exercise. I've been doing that over the last six months. This is where I like to start to add things like supersets so I can build more volume into the workout. Versus, I'm a new lifter or I haven't been lifting for a long time. I just start getting into it. I'm listening to Mind Pump. They talk about the benefits of supersets. So all of a sudden I'm throwing supersets into my workout. It's an advanced technique. Mm -hmm. And it also, it lends itself better with hypertrophy training. So, you know, cause you're going to fatigue the muscle. You're going to get this massive pump. If I'm strength training, uh, and like I said, like a five by five type of block, uh, I see less value in, in doing supersets. I see more value when I move into the 10 to 15 rep range and I'm chasing the pump, I'm chasing hypertrophy, then it makes more sense to throw supersets into the routine. You can abuse them just like any other thing. I, I see this is the, the the bad side is I've seen uh, people who all, all they're focused on is hypertrophy. All they're focused on mm -hmm. is body sculpting and that's all the routine consists of. I was it's, guilty of it's this. It's addictive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was guilty of this and I, I think so are a lot of uh, bodybuilders. Yeah, like, it, so, you won't get results, you won't continuously get results from them. Yeah, and it, it gives you this artificial feeling that you're getting results because you get a massive pump. Yeah, you get all aired up. And so you think that this is like the go-to every time. I want to walk out of the gym feeling nice and big and puffed up. And, the, you know, it provides that that feeling for sure. I've also used it too. Like if you want to go like biceps to triceps or you want to yes. do something like that in terms of not hitting the same muscle group, but now you're hitting opposing muscle groups, another valid way. To yeah. Use. Now the why, the reason why I like to do that is because of the feel. I, I don't know if it necessarily has any value value makes you look big on instagram it does <laughs> yeah. it does before i do any pictures i do lots of <laughs> guilty adam yeah. called me out yeah, yeah, yeah. uh no but but seriously so arnold loved doing a, a a chest to back superset so he would do this one he was famous for it he would go bench press to pull-ups so lats to chest now i don't know if there's any necessarily any muscle building benefits but there's a, a great feel benefit and i'll make this argument all day long the feel you get from your workouts contributes to your progress as well. If I start to enjoy the feeling of, of my workout and what I'm doing, I'm probably going to have better workouts. I'm probably going to have better focus. Here's the other thing with supersets. They taught me how to prime my body before I even knew what priming was all about. I'll give you, I'll tell you guys a story. When I was a kid working out, one of the hardest body parts for me to feel early on was my lats. It was really hard. I would do pull-ups and I would do rows and I would just get a pump of my biceps and my forearms. And it was really hard for me to feel anything happening in my lats. Part of it was because they were underdeveloped. I was a kid. The other part of it is I had no idea how to connect to them because they're on the back of my body. Mm -hmm. Don't know what they're supposed to feel like. So then I read this, this book by Mike Menser called Heavy Duty. And he talks about uh, pre-exhaust supersets where you do an isolation movement for a body part and then you go to a compound movement. And the, the whole concept of it was you pre-exhaust. For example, we we'll use the bench press fly example. When I do a bench press and I go to, let's say I go to failure, the muscles that may fail before the target muscle or the chest, that might get in the way of me progressing. If I fail on bench press, maybe it's my shoulders and my triceps that give out, not my chest. So how do I maximize the effect on my chest? I know I could pre-exhaust the chest by doing flies first, then going to the bench press. Now I'm going to pre-exhaust. Now they've done studies on this and there's pre-exhaust. There's some debate as to whether or not there's that, that there's any value to what I just said, mm. but there is value to this. So I couldn't feel my lats. I just say there is if you feel it. Yes. Mm. Yes. So I, I read this book. I did uh, lat, I did pullovers, dumbbell pullovers first, isolates lats. Then I did pull-ups first time in my, in my life. I felt my lats. I had a pump. From that day forward, I could connect to my lats when well, I did back If you've exercise. been training for a long time, you know this is like a great secret. If you get a client that uh, wants to develop their butt, mm -hmm. right? Common, uh, common one that you get as a trainer, 
and they they don't feel it though. Oh, Adam, every time I do squats, every time I do deadlifts, I feel it in my quads, I feel it in my hamstrings, but my butt just doesn't get pumped, it doesn't get sore. So one of the best things that you can do with a client like that, because we know, we've talked about this before, that squats and deadlifts are some of the best movements that you can do to build the butt. The problem with that is getting the butt to move and work and fire the way you want it to if, you, if you're not connected or you can't feel it. So I'll take a client over and we'll do floor bridges, single leg or both feet on the ground and actually get a pump in their butt or a pre-exhaust like Sal's talking about and then go over and do squats. Now they feel it. And they feel it more. Whether the the studies show that they build more of a butt from that or not, doesn't matter if the client can connect and feel the butt better, it's going to benefit them squatting if they're trying to develop their butt. Yeah, because then you start, what ends up happening is now you squat and you can feel the glutes and so you squat a little bit differently. Now you're activating the target muscle better. I think that has tremendous value. Unfortunately, the studies that, that, that do that, Adam, they don't do them long enough. Yeah. I think you need to follow people for a year with pre-exhaust techniques, and that's when you're going to see- It only makes sense, man. If you gain access now to that pathway, you can recruit you know, more muscle fibers at, at that point. Like, There's got to be a way to-, to you know, to, to, to study and prove the, the fact that like once we actually can highlight and activate, you know, certain muscle groups, like now, like having that access, I can like increase that. Totally. And so where will you find supersets in our programs? You'll find supersets in our body shaping, body building uh, type of routines. You know, the routines that really focus on when, you know, when you're trying to shape and sculpt right. and build Aesthetic, your body. split, PED, so, all have them. Yeah, MAP split. MAP split has lots of supersets towards the end because the, typically the way our programs work is there's different phases and different focuses. When you're focusing on strength and building strength, which also is very important, mm. no supersets. Yeah. But when you get to the end, now we're progressing to these supersets and you'll find the last phase is full of these pump-inducing supersets. And when you do it that way, man, the results are just are just crazy. Next question is from Connor Alex Smith. Can you explain how to take advantage of using angles when lifting? Yeah, good questions, Justin. Yeah, well, no. so you guys like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, is there any nutrition today? Nope, no, no. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about cheese? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was looking for the barbecue sauce question. Yeah. It wasn't no, there. No, so um, so angles. So okay, I'm going to try and explain this uh, both in how you you would understand it in terms of results, but also how it works. So. Results-wise, here's the bottom line. Training body parts with different angles of pull, uh, different uh, periods of, of, of t- or points of tension mm-hmm. is going to give you better results than if you just do the same thing all the time. That's just a fact. Okay, yeah. You ask any trainer or coach who's been working with people for a long time, that's just the bottom line. Now, how does it work? Well, if you imagine your bicep, we'll focus on that because that's an easy one to understand. If I'm doing a, a dumbbell standing dumbbell curl, so I have a free weight dumbbell, when I curl the dumbbell up, let's say it's a 35-pound dumbbell, I'm not directly opposing 35 pounds until my hand is about parallel to the ground. Right at the halfway point. Right, mm-hmm. because that's where the where I'm fighting gravity directly, right? From from there up, it's a little easier. And from the bottom to the midpoint, I'm pushing, you know, I'm kind of curling the 35 out and up. And once I get to that midpoint, now it's max tension. So my bicep is achieving max tension about halfway through it's full contraction. And when you look at muscle fibers and the way they, they contract, they slide along each other and they attach in order to, as, as they're sliding, they, they, they attach to each other to, to create tension. Mm-hmm. So maximum tension in a dumbbell curl is in the midpoint of contraction. That's great. Now, what about a concentration curl? Now I'm bending over. Now I'm opposing gravity directly when my bicep is fully contracted. Now I get max tension at the squeeze. What about a preacher curl? Now the max tension is in the more stretched position. So that's one example of how angles will hit muscles differently, creating different points of tension. And that's why you get better right. results. And it's really the, the novelty of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, more than anything else, right? More than the, the degree of the angle or the specific exercise, it's the novelty of it. I mean, when you do something over and over that our bodies are they're adaptation machines yep. eventually they get adapted to whatever it is that you're doing and then the results the change that you get from that starts to diminish one of the easiest ways to keep that progress happening is by 
manipulating angles and things like that. Sure, it's not that where where it gets wrong and where there's like all this debate argument is when people try and make the case that oh this is working the peak of the bicep or right. this is what makes the, the the round part of your bicep or this is the no. <laughs> uh, you know when they start saying that you're targeting a, here's the thing it's impossible to isolate one muscle, okay? Our, our, bo our bodies all work together. So you can't even isolate one muscle, much less a part of a muscle. So that never happens. Like everything's working together. But you can target a muscle differently so that it seems new. This is different. I'm pulling from a different direction. Even though I've done a curl, a bicep curl here, I've done that a, a hundred times, doing it with my elbow up above my head and curling, it's still a curl. The biceps still work. All of the bicep is still working, but because it's novel and it's different, it's a new stimulus, and then that we get that new adaptation, which is going to yeah. help you progress. Now, biomechanics still applies. So there are like like angles that you know aren't aren't very effective, you know, for certain muscle groups and they're not going to activate and stimulate that. So like keeping that in mind in terms of, you know, keeping your, your elbow, for instance, in, in the same pathway, but now I'm raising it up or I'm lowering it, but I'm not bringing it way outside and flaring it out. There's, there's certain points of, of where, you know, that makes sense. Like well, I'm, yeah. And the, the rules of physiology and anatomy still apply. It still applies right. is the point. And a, a, an easier example for somebody is um, a tricep pushdown. If you do a tricep pushdown uh, on a cable machine and you do it with a triangle, a rope, a straight bar, a reverse grip, yeah. all the same. You're, the, yeah, the, the the physics is still yeah. like I'm yeah. pushing the this elbow down. still in the yeah. same position. Yes. Tension points are still in the position. Yeah. Slightly different. Is it enough of a novel signal to 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 cause any change? Probably not. Yeah. Right. Probably not. Right. Now here's the other thing too. Let's, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, different points of tension. Well, what if I just use a cable? What if I use a cable which gives me the same weight throughout the whole range of motion? Do angles still matter? They do because then it depends on what position the muscle is in when it's pulling or contracting. So now my elbow in front of me, side to me, uh, behind me, whether I'm pulling the, the weight with the, each of those positions, because the position is different, it's still considered novel. So angles are important. Now, here's where people get in trouble, and, and Justin – kind of touched on this. People think, oh, this is great. I'm going to get crazy. I'm going to do all kinds of weird right. and crazy stuff. Yeah. Look, you could use all the, sideways now. You could use all the angles you want for your quads and, and all those angles aren't going to be as effective as squats. It's just straight up, you know, loaded barbell squats. You know, you could do all the angles in the world uh, for your shoulders, but, you know, overhead shoulder press is going to be the king of all exercises. It's just one factor. Angles is one factor. It's an important one. But you don't want to get caught up because I've seen this where people go to the no, gym. No, this is a good point. This yeah. is uh, this is really common right now in the you know the Instagram world we live in, where yeah. you know these popular bodybuilders, who what people fail to realize these amazing physiques that we follow and idolize, these these guys and girls they have they've covered all the bases. They're doing all the the major good lifts. They're consistent as shit. Their diet is dialed. They haven't taken a day off in five years. And then you see him do like a sideways chest press on a hammer strength machine. And you think, oh my God, he looks this way. He's doing that. I should be doing this also, or I'm going to incorporate that. Now he can get away with doing a, a lesser valuable exercise because he's doing so much other stuff. And that's where you got to be careful is where you're at in your lifting career. If you know, do not replace a sideways chest press uh, for your your barbell bench press, I mean, get your get your good compound big lifts and be consistent. Get great at those. See progress in all those. Yeah, if you're training six seven days in the gym and you've been lifting for years and years, and you want to get creative and add different uh, exercise in there, th then there's some value to that. But don't don't do that. Uh, you know, in to replace something that has got a much higher value. Yeah, and yeah. and it's you know I know it can be confusing. You know, if you're if you're listening, you're like, gosh, there's so many exercises to pick from. There's so many different angles, so many different ways to alter tension. Um, and I get that. It is very complicated and there is a hierarchy of exercises and, and there is a way to combine different tension points to give you better results. If it's complicated or too complicated for it and you want the, the, the guesswork taken out, then just follow a, an established program. I mean, we obviously have created a lot of really good programs. And so we've done that, right? We've done that yeah. for you. We've plugged in the right exercise, the right combinations to take advantage of all these different factors. Next question is from Ethan Schlemmer. 
What are your favorite exercises to increase a person's sense of balance? I think this is especially important for trainers working with the older age adults. Oh, I love this. This is another great question. Um, so number one, the most important thing that will benefit your balance is to be strong. That's yep. number one. So when you're working with old, I, used to, I worked with a lot of uh, people in advanced age, and I would, you know, they would, they would sometimes they would come in and they would have maybe have gone online or their, you know, their 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 daughter brought them in to hire me, and then the, the daughter said, "Hey, I went online, and there's all these like." foot balancing exercises, standing on one leg, whatever. And I'm like, look, your mom is just weak right now. Yeah. The reason why her balance is bad is she's just not strong. So every time she takes a step, everything feels weak and shaky. Number one, get strong. That's number one. If Such you get a strong, good point. Because yeah. that is the, the natural tendency, especially for trainers, is to now incorporate these unstable type tools, you know, and, and incorporate that or the single leg, single arm and, and really try to, to, you know, to, to challenge the client that way. Whereas it really is just instability. It's, it's lack of strength and, and support around, you know, the joint. So to, to be able to get that, you need to really work on just purely strength training. Totally. So I have a, I, I'm going to give this person an exercise. It's, it's funny that you picked this, Justin, literally, uh, last week, I'm talking to a client of mine, uh, and she's in her 50s, and we we were doing something, and I actually made a point. I said, listen, at one point in our lives, we'll probably be in different places, and uh, we won't have the opportunity to train together. This may be the single most important exercise I want you to do forever, and that was a step up to a single leg balance to an opposite hand toe touch. Oh. And I did that exercise so many times with the, clients. That, that exercise I like for a lot of reasons. We talk about the importance of strength. A step up uh, the, is a, such a great strength building exercise, mm -hmm. especially as we age. Yep. It's a, a quick one we lose. The balance and stability portion, obvious reasons why that's important, proprioception and then stability, right? And that especially with the hip, right? The hip and the glute, making sure they're being able to stabilize on one leg in that. And then the, the hinging over with the opposite hand, you get a little bit of rotational and anti-rotational movement in there. So the you you cover you cover multiple planes you throw in some strength you have some stability and my point i was making to her i said of all the things i teach you that is important and i say a lot of things are important you know this is an exercise that you can really do on your own at home and you know it's a good way for you to gauge that you're not losing this don't lose this ability to be able to step up balance opposite hand come over and touch your toe like that and be able to do at least 10 or so on each side really good that's a great point i think too like you have to consider like what the functional movements are for your daily activities like and what you're doing around the house what you're lifting you know like how can we support you and ba and gain balance in those movements and a lot of times people are in in a split stance position you know very rarely are we you know bilateral and we're standing nice and balanced all the time. So uh, that's definitely one thing I consider and, and I bring in lunges and I bring in uh, step ups and things like that to, to make sure that yes, the, you know, your, your hips and, and your major muscle groups are, you know, responding and, and, and pulling in and, and centralizing uh, your balance that way. Now there's, there's, here's another part that I recently got my mind uh, changed uh, uh, by uh, Joe DeFranco, who I consider to be one of the best uh, trainers you'll find uh, in the fitness space. And uh, he made the point of the value of plyometrics training for everybody. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a, there's a range of plyometrics training. Yes. So you have the extreme performance type of plyometrics training, then you have the more e easy kind of general, just like jump in place type of plyometrics training. And he made such a good point. And I felt, I, I knew exactly what he was talking about because before he came in uh, to be on our podcast, this was a while ago, before we talked about this, I was helping my dad unload his working van. He had some stuff in the back, and, I, and my dad has a bad back, so I'm unloading stuff. To get out of the back of the van, I just had to jump out. It's not a high jump. It's a work van, so it's like jumping out of the back of a truck. And I remember I landed, and it just I didn't land very well. I told you about that when it happened to me. Remember <laughs> jumping out of my truck? Oh, so you know exactly. Land yeah. on eggshells, guys. Yes. I just on. landed. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, whoa, this doesn't. And I'm strong. I work out. Yeah. So Joe DeFranco comes in, and I'm asking him about plyometrics for the average person. He goes, Yeah, you know, you can be strong. That'll give you that first initial general balance. But then you need to be able to express it if you like twist or jump, or right. that's why you should practice at least some type of plyometrics. So if you're advanced lifter, or you're pretty fit. And you don't think you need to work on balance? Uh, I'll challenge you. 
even just jumping in place or jumping on a bench or just jumping yeah, down off the bench. Right. Yeah. yeah, just practicing because if you don't practice that skill, trust me, you lose it. No. Next question is from Anahata Lifestyle. What do you think you young people in their 20s need to hear about training and nutrition? What are their biggest misconceptions? Misconceptions. Easy there, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> I butchered that one. <laughs> so what? Okay, so people in their twenties. I got to think of myself. What do we think they need to hear as far as training and nutrition, and what are their biggest misconceptions? I think one of the biggest misconceptions in your twenties right now, and I and I think it's something. It's not new. You've heard this on a mind pump a million times. Uh, it's the over application of intensity. Yeah. Uh, everybody on Instagram is is making a martyr of themselves uh, to show their sacrifice. Right. How bad do you want it? If you care bad enough, four a.m. clock in. Yeah, exactly. Or showing pictures of your watch at four a.m. every day in beast mode and all. And so we've over glorified the value and the benefits of intensity to the point where. Everybody thinks that in order to get a very effective workout, you've got to be hobbling out of the gym the next day or done. And the reason why that it, it works when you're 20 and you can do that and you can kind of like go up, you know, the yo yo back and forth. Oh, I'm on and I'm crushing it for a while, then I'm off and I'm on and I'm crushing it for a while, then I'm off. And then eventually you get older and you go like, you what ends up happening to these 20 year olds 20 years later. Is they recall what they the way they were training in their twenties, and, and they, they try and duplicate it. They either try and duplicate it, or they just write it off. Fuck that. Yeah, I'd rather be I a can't little. Do it now. Yeah, I'd rather just accept the dad bod and just you know forget. I don't want to exercise. That I mean, I have friends that were like this because even in our era there was an Instagram that was promoting this. But the the athletic mindset, like we we all trained like we were professional athletes, and mm -hmm. training to be healthy and aesthetically fit is totally different than a wide receiver for the NFL and you have no business nor do you need to train that way but that's what sexy that's what's sexy on Instagram so i think yeah. the kids in their 20s that are that listen to this podcast need to evaluate who they're following and the message that they're presenting and what i see a lot of is the over application of intensity. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And I'll add to that in terms of, I think that, that sleep is definitely, mm. with the 20-year-old uh, mindset, is is definitely an afterthought. And I, and I think that the biggest sort of awakening I've had in terms of the way that I am able to still progress is, you know, like getting better quality sleep and, and being able to be fully recovered and allow my body to actually repair and, and rebuild itself. That That's such a vital component to building muscle and to, you know, thriving and being healthy and operating, you know, all systems of the body. And so I think that it's definitely undervalued when you're young. You just think that you can just keep going and hammering your way through like everything. And, you know, sleep is something that you'll get to eventually. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to, I'm going to balance that out a little bit because I, you guys are hundred percent right, but I'm going to balance it out. And I'm going to say this, if there's any point in your life where you where it's uh, appropriate to test your limits <laughs> yeah. and to see... No joke, no Damn joke. It, Sal. Yeah. If there's ever a time in your no, life where you can work as much as you possibly can just to see where your limits are, push yourself hard to see where your limits are. Don't hurt yourself, but just to see what you're capable of, your 20s is the time to do it. That's when you... If, you, if you're going to work 80 hours or 150 hours a week or whatever, go for it. If you're going to work out two or three times a day, Okay, go ahead and test it out. If you're going to drink with your buddies and whatever, yeah. that's the time you want to test out your limits. Totally fine. Of course, be safe. The real lesson, in my opinion, from the 20s is this, is that uh, be growth-minded because it doesn't last forever. Mm. It's okay to learn your limits, but then learn how to fine-tune everything and be okay with changing as your life changes. As things change, context changes, you have to be okay with letting that go because mm. I know a lot of people who get stuck. They get so stuck in that mind space that now they're 30 or 40, they have kids, and no, 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 I'm still going to be like I was in my 20s. They burn themselves out. They get sick. They hammer their metabolisms. They get injured. 
that's where the problems uh, really lie. Yeah, I th- I, yeah, and I think that that raises a good point. But also, I think they could do a better job of being able to push themselves, but finding themselves back at homeostasis. Like, yeah, and I think that that doesn't even get considered uh, when you're in the mentality of like, I'm just going to hammer through work. I'm going to hammer through these workouts. Like, I'm you know, I'm just not going to sleep. And then later, it builds like really bad habits, like going forward. It does. So. You get used to it, and you think that that's how you're always going to be, or you cause long-term, uh, p- potentially long-term damage. I mean, I would have clients that would come see me in their mid-30s and they're so burnt out that it would take me a year, no joke, it would take me a full year of scaling down exercise, getting better sleep, looking at their nutrition. After a year, their body finally started responding because it took us that long to repair what happened before. Or it was somebody in their 20s who they could eat whatever they want. They had a fast metabolism. Now I have them in their 30s, and they've got four food intolerances. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they have you know irritable bowel syndrome or yeah. you know inflammatory. Find type out they're issues. not indestructible. Totally. So you can definitely push yourself, but you got to listen to your body and be smart about it. But again, if you're going to test yourself and see where those limits are, that's probably uh, the time to do it. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. Also, find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.